Sorry. I'm Gunther Nösler. I Sorry. work for Airy, technical sales uh, of Alexa cameras and Airy uh, Amira cameras. Um, I'm Mike Jackman. I'm the uh, co-chair of the New York Production Alliance, who uh, we present the lounge here uh, today uh, and this week. I'm the executive vice president of post-production for Film Nation Entertainment. Um, I am a uh, chief business development officer for a company called Brevity, which is a technology company that moves and compresses and transcodes files. And I have a small uh, digital cinema mastering company as well. I'm busy and tired. <laughs> <laughs> and he's based in New York. Absolutely. My name is Jennifer Lane. I'm a post-production supervisor. I've worked on independent films and studio films, all in New York. Starting when you were five. Starting when I was five years old. I'm on the board of the Post New York Alliance, which also has a booth here. Uh, and I just want to say one quick thing just about New York in general, because I said something about the post ads break. New York in general, if you shoot a film there, for anybody who doesn't know this in the room, if you shoot a film and do post-production there, um, and you qualify, you get there's a 30% tax incentive, which means you get 30% back eventually. But no, <laughs> you're not getting it before you deliver the film. <laughs> so no, that money is not there to be used for deliveries. So hence the devil is in your deliverables. Yes. If you want the yes. dollars, deliver the right way. Yes, exactly. And, uh, and in post, if you shoot a movie somewhere else, and you post in New York, it's 30% tax incentive in New York City and 35% in upstate. And in 2016, 15, uh, it will be 45% tax incentive in certain counties upstate. Paul Rackman, uh, director, filmmaker, and co-founder of Slamdance. And, um, you know, one of the last things I'll say is um, no matter how small a film or how many times you've made a film or how many films you make, you're always, always going to make mistakes, even the best of them. And making those mistakes is the best way to learn how to not make more mistakes. So just, you really have to be fearless. And you, you know, you could worry to death about every single thing that could go wrong, but it's just going to make it so much harder. So you, you kind of have to go for it, too. All right. Thank you, everyone. I'm Alex Halpern. I am a director, filmmaker, uh, founding partner of Post Factory New York, also a member of the Post New York Alliance. Uh, I'd like everybody to kind of uh, sort of talk about, we'll start with Gunter, he's going to talk a little bit about the impact of 4K and this new camera, and we're going to move from there. Everybody's giving me little questions, so Gunter, why don't you start? Um, talk about how choosing the right camera kind of impacts going all the way through to the end. Thanks, Alex. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, we have the one early prototype of the Amira camera here today, it's not a 4K camera, it's actually an uh, HD camera, but it aims, uh, it has the same sensor as the Alexa camera, it aims particularly at documentary filmmaking and television and sports. And uh, when we talk about deliverables, uh, I think it's important to know at the beginning where are you going to be showing uh, your product, your film, your documentary. And um, again, I, I think the 4K question is more of a consumer-driven aspect that um, very few people understand. Um, again, um, when you say consumer, you mean like well, so consumers, pushing new television? Yes, they're, they're, they're pushing new televisions for, um, for the consumers and new camcorders for consumers saying 2K or 4K sounds better than 2K, yet again, uh, we have, as of today, 90% of features are done in a 2K projection in a theater right. using uh, basically 2048 resolution, and yet nobody can see a benefit okay. unless you're sitting in the first three rows of a movie theater. So, I mean, that's something to consider if you think about a home television that you have at your house, um, how close are you sitting to that? Are you going to be 10 inches in, in front of that TV to see a 4K picture? You know, I mean. So basically, you can't see the 4K picture. You can't see yet. the 4K unless you're sitting really close. Right. Well, so, Mike and, and Jan, why don't you guys talk about, from a deliverables point of view, how this is affecting your side of it? Because, Mike, at Film Nation, you have to get this stuff 
from filmmakers and, and, and you guys have to make decisions that obviously this drives cost significantly uh, you know on the facility side are there even what facilities are even equipped to deal with 4k and how does it drive rates and take it from there? well I think I think it's really interesting I mean also just to talk about that 4k TV again it's very very much you know the, the broadcasters and, and um, uh, companies that make those televisions that are really pushing them out there uh, a 4K TV or even uh, like an 8K TV, which they're also talking about, wouldn't fit in the living room. Would have to be, you know, in order to have any impact. But 4K TV at home, you don't need to be that close, but you need to be a very specific distance away to have any impact. But it's definitely the push is on because 3D didn't work, so now we're there moving to 4K, I and mean, that's really what we're hearing. Sort of, uh, I do a lot of work in sports as well, and it's really being pushed for that. Um, in terms of 4K deliverables. Um, it's kind of interesting. You've got companies like Netflix that are insisting that everything is, is finished in 4K. Um, there's a TV series, few TV series that are going to shoot in 4K. It's not going to be broadcast in 4K, right? But it's, it's going to shoot and finish and have everything in 4K for whatever reason because they decided that would be, that would sound, I, I'm sure there's a better reason than it would sound like very progressive. But, I mean, it is a higher resolution. It's more future-proof. I guess you can do a lot of things with it down the road. The current use of it is... As you said, you're going to see it on a HD TV or a download, so it's never going to be at that resolution. But the costs are significantly higher, mostly because those files are just bigger. They're right. huge files. It takes more storage. Um, it's harder to move them around, and um, and it's literally all of the processing is just more timely and costly and um, storage hog. But once you get past that. You know, once you everything. Get, once you get past it's all great. <laughs> once you get past everything that makes it miserable, if you're an independent filmmaker, it makes it even it makes the uh, sort of barrier for entry higher. You know, yeah, yeah. and it's terrific. But, so, so, Jen, why don't you? Um, so we need a cup of coffee or some napkins. <laughs> oh, damn. Um, Jen, why don't you talk about it from the practical side? Because you're you're really even more in the trenches than Mike in terms of dealing with the filmmakers, and you're sort of, you're the person in between a company like Film Nation and the filmmakers and sort of getting that, the funnel, that, that bottleneck where it all comes to from the moment production's done and, and some of the problems that you've encountered, it both from just the normal process and now as we're transitioning into this 4K world. Okay, um, I haven't worked in 4K and uh, I have se had several filmmakers who shot in 2K and insisted on doing their DI in 4K only to do a test in front of them showing them a 2K test and a 4K test and asked which do you like better not telling them which is which like the you know the coke test from the 80s so uh, 2K is a phenomenal format and I as an independent filmmaker I wouldn't even consider 4K it is a massive amount of storage massive amount of drives it, everything will take longer to do. It is just a more difficult process. Your visual effects will cost more because its render time is more. I just wouldn't even consider it as um, an independent filmmaker. I don't even want to do it in, as like a studio filmmaker because it's just it, it just will. It's a bigger hassle, and I know it's 4K, so it's supposed to be the best. But the first thing I would do is do a test. Do a test with ProRes files, 2K files, 4K files. If you're really considering it and the labs will help you do a test and project it and have them not tell you which is which, have them mix it up and immediately you will see great product from all the different formats. Um, I, I just did an independent film that was on ProRes. We, they I made, them, made sure they tested 2K versus ProRes because they couldn't afford the 4K. And they were happy with the result of the uh, ProRes. It was a film about a couple in New York City. They liked they like the, the result of it, but I definitely recommend testing, 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 project, project, project okay. before you make any decision. So, Paul, why don't you talk about that, the idea of, you know, how can you test when you're the one-man shop, which you well, are, how do you yeah. test pre-plan and how do you conceptualize, I'm starting today and I know I'm <coughs> delivering to Sony three years from now, <laughs> which I've done, I've done that journey with you. How, yeah. how do you think well, that and conceptualize it? Well, I've done both because, I've, I've, you know, my first feature was a narrative feature. We, I had everything. I had supervised, I had everything. We finished on film. And so I've, I've, and on my documentaries, I've done everything myself. So my background is really, my roots is as an editor. You know, I, start, I started as an editor just out of college and then 
that got into directing music videos and all that. But I always kind of kept a foot in, in post. I enjoy editing. And that means keeping up with all the technology and keeping up with, you know, how to do things. Um, and I, I just kept with that over the years. And, and, you know, just discussing the 2K, 4K thing, just as, as a filmmaker and user of these technologies, you know, there's always the time when it comes out and that the technology is just like, it's like too big for everything out there. But like three years from now, all the computer power that's going to be available is going to be able to handle it's not going to be a problem. I remember when ProRes 4444 came, first came out, it's like, oh, I don't use it, it's crashing, and you know, the Avid is turning out green. There were all these problems with it for the first 18 months, and then three years later, it's like, it's, it's like nothing. So, you know, I think three years from now, 4K is going to be much more easily manageable because the computer power will be there, the software power will be there, everybody would have made all the mistakes already <laughs> and how to do it right, and that's what's going to happen, and it'll happen very, very, very fast, because it always does. So you're starting... So, so, so to get back to the... Early, I just wanted to comment on what they were talking about. Um, I mean, what I do, um, you know, on my, on my documentaries, I edit them. So I'm, I'm shooting the footage, or, you know, working with DP and, and getting the footage afterwards, and... It, it really starts with organization and just keeping your files organized in, in, in a practical way. And you know, keeping certain drives for your original footage, do, keeping drives just for your down converts and backing everything up. And it all takes time and it's time consuming, but you know, you're saving probably 50% of your costs you know, you know, compared to doing all that stuff with a facility. But it, it is, you can, it's very, I make mistakes all the time, <laughs> you know. I'm, you know, every film I, I conform, even the last doc I conformed, I shoot multiple formats, and sure enough, you know, two days of the conform was like really easy, and three days was like, oh, all these shots are missing. But you have to, you have to be able to be prepared to deal with those things with patience and ask questions and ask for help. And what I try to do, the two things that I just don't, I don't do is I don't do color correction and DI and, and sound mixing. You st I still think there are people better. Uh, you can buy the equipment to do it at home, but I'm not a sound mixer. I'm not a, I'm not a colorist. But what I do try to do is I try to conform. I conform my last two documentaries on you know on IMAX, on powerful IMAX. And that when I show up to Post Factory for, for color correction, I give them a drive. I can start in the color correction room like in five minutes. It's completely ready for that. And literally, all I do with them is color. And um, you know, I'll, and then when I'm totally finished, I'll come back for delivery. So, so, so organization and patience and willing to learn and. And you know, there's a lot of editors who you can hire who are getting more and more used to doing things this way too. So, you know, speaking of backup, because that's something you know, that, that asks answers your question. I think it does. And I want to lead into what Jen and I were talking earlier, uh, getting ready for this. You were talking about backup issues and organization, because I think most people aren't like Paul. Most people, we, there's still a lot of filmmakers in the world that are like need a lot more handholding, and especially it seems. My experience on the facility side is the further up people go, the more successful they become, they sort of become wanting more handholding. Like, oh, now I'm entitled. So can you talk about or yeah, Oh, I just want to add one thing before she answers that. I'm also, I'm the producer, I'm the director, I'm the writer, right. I'm the editor on a lot of these films. Awesome. Maybe a few outside investors, whereas... Yeah, I'm sure she's going to talk about there's a lot of people managing involved. Right. Um, sometimes I advise on um, independent films before they start. And I always say, figure out the workflow and the, and the backup method because we've all had computers that have crashed and you've lost documents and photos. And it's just like that. It's a great system and you have a backup. One backup is not enough. I Twice, two different films in the last year, we lost files. They just disappeared from the drives that the labs had. We don't know why. I don't think it was the lab's fault. It was, it was just a dropout. It just disappeared. So we had to pull up the extra copy that you keep somewhere else just in case there's a fire. And that is number one rule because it's a, it's digital, drives crash. They they just, they do. They, it's, um, it's, it's unfortunate and it doesn't happen all the time, but something can happen in list files. So that is the number one rule I would say. Shooting digital, back it up and then store it somewhere else for safety. 
Might yeah. you want to take the change? Sure. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of take it from the end of, you know, Filmation is a, uh, primarily an international sales agent, so we are receiving deliverables from, um, you know, from everyone. I'm, I'm the one who writes those horrible delivery schedules that you guys all have to deal with that have elements on it. You go, why the hell am I giving him 35 millimeter film? Um, but uh, I would say, just from a backup perspective, <clears throat> you know, one of the things we require, we don't require a ton of backups, right? Because by the time we get it, we're interested in the final version. But you know, we need those, you know, we need those properly backed up DPX sequences because we don't know. We've got a license term for a certain number of years, and we never know what's going to happen with them. So we want to have access to the original elements. We actually not only ask for the backup of the final, but we ask for access to the original elements that were used to create it in case that backup is gone. So we're looking for a backup to the backup, and we wouldn't really know what to do with it. We'd have to hire someone to fix, you know, to recompile the, reconform the entire thing. But you know, these things are key because that is the value of your product. You know, that your asset isn't an asset if half of it disappears. Um, and that backing up from production all the way through post and then delivery is hugely important. So planning it from the beginning, what's going to happen to my source files, where are they going to be, what's the multiple backup copies, where are those going to be stored, are they going to be geographically dispersed, so if something happens in one place, I've got another copy in another place. You know, we're going to be moving into cloud storage solutions, um, and which is an interesting double-sided thing because the cloud itself, everyone likes to talk about the cloud and what it is and what it means. What it means to me, the benefit, and I can think of lots of you know, downsides, but the benefit of a good cloud storage solution is going to be automatic migration of your assets, checking them all the time, periodically checking to make sure that they are the same as they were a year ago or six months ago, and then be able to do asset migration. This is in a format that is, or even if it's in a codec, that is no longer readable or that is being outdated that the, the, it has the promise of keeping your content current and verified. There really isn't, the, there aren't those solutions out there that are as sophisticated as that, but they'll be going that way. Go into one. Can I say one more thing? Are you jump right in? Yes. So, you know, a lot of filmmakers are out there, they're making their film, they don't have a distributor, and they do have a limited budget. So you have to think towards, working towards like cloud solutions and all these deliverables, just buy a, an extra terabyte drive. I mean, they're so affordable now. Just, just prepare for that. Even though you're you, you're so limited on funds, that is such a worthy five hundred dollar investment. Get an extra drive, put it in two places for safety. Even if you have no money, find that because it is your master. If you lost a, piece, a roll of negative when we were shooting film, that was it. You had to reshoot. So just treat it as something safe. But Gunter, speaking of film versus digital, in the old days. I, I don't think lots of people lost a roll of negative. Of course not. But, yeah. but, but, but you can be on set, yeah. and I've had this happen to me on set, where you're shooting with a digital camera, and it disappears right there. Like you just did like you know four setups, and all of a sudden, the, the guy goes, it's like the equivalent of checking the gate, and it's like something happened. So how is it, what's the redundancy in the camera even, and how is that working towards helping the filmmaker already, before you even get to the edit room? Again, there's there's some safety issues where uh, safety functions are built into our cameras um, that may not be in other cameras where you have always a closing of a file that happens every second so even if something happens accidentally and you have a five minute take or so only the last second is gone we do this through UDF recording and camera um, back again to the data management and also an aspect that I feel is really never really discuss is what do we perceive as better looking and this technology 4k stuff is always it's coming from the industry from the technology point of view it's really not what we humans are kind of perceive as the better choice um, it's it's almost we had a little example set up um, the last time you guys had a Dolby monitor here right. where we had a 2k monitor and a 4k monitor showing 4K and 2K, and yet again, the perception of the 2K monitor, it had the ability to show an extended dynamic range. And everybody was assuming the 2K image, the 2K image was the 4K image, just because of the way we perceive things. It had nothing to do with the actual pixels that are on that monitor. Now, there's a benefit, of course, um, not having that much data. We were talking about data management, loss of data. 
if you're starting with 4K or RAW, you have a tremendous amount of data that you have to back up. So it's, it's, it's quadrupling your storage amount. It quadruples, I mean, I don't know, on, on, on the cost side. If there's no benefit on the deliverable side, and again, I, you, you also mentioned Amazon, Netflix, they're now requiring 4K. Well, what, what is their delivery pipeline? How much do they deliver of this 4K original? It's basically, I mean, I, it's right now, between... Right they don't deliver any. It's right. between... Yeah. So if, there's, it's if between you think zero about, and nine. They're, they're delivering 6 megabits per second to 60. Well, a 4K uncompressed image is 6,000 megabits per second. Guess how much percentage that is? That's 0.01%. Now, what do you think you're going to get as a benefit? You know, if you're only receiving 0.01% of an image, you know, so I think that the improvement has to be done on the, deli on, on the pipeline where you get this data. Again, but thinking about, now, wouldn't, wouldn't it, be, it be better to have a HD picture where you get more of that HD picture rather than having a 4K picture and you're getting just the same pipeline, you're getting just a little less of that because we're compressing it. As you said, it doesn't matter, right? A good story is a good story. Uh, you look at, um, you know, that, the Enron movie, which was shot, you know, looks, looked horrible, but didn't matter. It was fascinating. Even Langfish. Right? Uh, super, uh, super size. It was shot on many TV. And, um, you know, you, there's strobing and there's all sorts of issues, but it didn't matter, right? It made no right. difference. So, you know, we don't, we don't buy what the movie looks like. We buy the movie. And, uh, and so does the audience. And so does the audience. And so, I mean, that literally becomes, you know, making all of the different types of elements we need for deliverables out of, you know, in the best quality that you can deliver. And if the, you know, the master quality is mini DD, you know, or is from your iPhone or from a, um, an iPad HD, you know, whatever, then, then ultimately that's fine. We're not going to, you know, we don't reject it from that. What we reject is if you've got a 4K image and you create a crappy looking deliverable because somewhere in your pipeline you, you know, weren't paying attention, something got down converted, you made a copy of a copy. I mean, there's a lot of ways to go wrong if you're not planning on it. So, um, again, what we need from a deliverable standpoint, we need it. We need everything that we need to exploit the film worldwide. The source, from our perspective, doesn't matter, and Filmation currently doesn't require uh, 4K deliverables. So we require a 2K deliverable. Um, I still require and negotiate. You talked about independent filmmaking. We'll negotiate about 35 millimeter because I still have territories around the world. So if I'm distributing your film and I've got um, Malaysia, who will pay me $150,000, but they need 35 millimeter. We're going to have a discussion about whether we should sell that territory because, all right, it's going to cost you $60,000 for film out and you know $10,000 or $15,000 for an IP and an IN and a check print. We'll do the math, um, but we'll we'll have that in our delivery requirements because that still is an important element. Um, but 35 millimeter is becoming a discussion point now. And sometimes I'll make it contingent. Do you foresee a world where there? Uh, do you foresee a world where that thirty-five millimeter print goes away? Yeah, as soon as Kodak stops making the film, if if the demand on in a t in different territories goes away, or if I've got a territory that's only paying a fifteen thousand dollar you know guarantee for a movie, um, but they require thirty-five, we may just not make the sale. We may say, look, you got to go digital, and eventually, as digital cinema um, around the world becomes more ubiquitous, we'll have less reason to have 35, and I think it will go away. Um, right now, one of our biggest areas that we need it is Latin America. Right. So, Paul, when you hear all this from a, a, a filmmaker, creative point of view, and you're thinking, like, what's, what's, the next, what's the next thing I want to make? How does it affect uh, or inform your aesthetic or uh, creative choices? in terms of like planning your future. I agree with most of what's been said about you know, the quality and the story being the most important and all that. And I totally agree. You know, I, um, you know when, when I'm ready to start a next picture, depending on what it is, whether it's a doc or a narrative or a short, you know, there's this great, I was talking with a filmmaker the other day. We were joking about, you know, what can filmmakers learn from uh, Donald Rumsfeld? You know, and in indie film, I love that. Yeah, Donald Rumsfeld has this great quote that he got a lot of um, crap for, but it was, you go to war with the army you have. You know, and indie filmmaking, particularly DIY filmmaking, that's, that's really what it's about. So you're raising money, you're raising money 
for like a narrative feature and okay, you want like a million dollars, but oh, we can only raise 600K. It's gonna, you know, it's, take, it's taken us, it's taken us, you know, two years to raise 500K. Um, let's make the movie. Let's figure out how to make the movie for, for 500K instead of, you know, a million, you know? So a lot of those issues come up. So, you know, if it's super, super, super low budget, I'm gonna look at the equipment I own. And okay, can I do it this way? What's going to come out on the other other side? Or do I need to buy a newer camera or something like that? So it's really about when you're really ready to go, how much money you have, and what you have access to. And then you're just figuring it out. So you're reverse engineering into what Mike needs. And so then my question for Jen would be, because you come into the process after it's already going, after Paul or filmmaker X has said, well, I'm doing it. And then, they, then they're in it, and they come and get you, and they're like, this is what I've got. How do I get it to Mike? How do you, how do you feel about that? Do you, is there a way for you to come into the process earlier? Is there a way for them to benefit from the knowledge that you have? You know, or do you feel like you're still coming into the process in the right place? If you can bring someone who has budgeting and post knowledge in advance, bring them in because it is so much more beneficial if I come in in advance, come in during pre-production work for a couple days and then leave until post-production. It is, you must, you need to budget. If your plan and your hope is to sell the movie, uh, the first thing you need to do is figure out what is the basic requirement for most of these studios and hold some money for it, hold some money in contingency. It is a bummer that film is still required um, sometimes for one territory, but I'm, it, it still happens. Uh, the film I worked on, Disappearance of Eleanor Rigby, sold at Toronto, needs to deliver full film elements uh, to the Weinstein Company for very few territories, but they need it, and it's a part of it. And who, also, who pays for that? Do they sometimes, pay for that or does Weinstein? That's pay for the that? fight. You have to know when you negotiate the sale, they will not pay for it. It's going to come out of that sale money, and it is expensive. A full set, it, exactly. A film out could be forty thousand dollars. You, you will spend $150,000 to $200,000 making deliverables. So you do, the whole, you do the whole struggle that Paul does, and yes. you get to the finish line, and Harvey shows up, and he's like, I want your movie, and you're like, yay! And then you pop the champagne, and you can't even afford the bottle of champagne, because now you got to pay for everything that Harvey or Mike needs. Right, now you might not be able to uh, budget for that in advance, but just know it's going to come out at the sale price because the studio is not going to pay for that on top of what they bought. That, that, that's the you got you to plan on that. I, I would also say, you know, bring on someone like Jen beforehand when you're making the deal, when you're negotiating that delivery schedule. Don't forget there is a delivery schedule. Everybody goes, oh, how much am I getting and how many territories and blah, blah, blah. We're getting, but, we're getting nothing. Right. <laughs> but don't forget. You're still paying. Because, you know, when we get someone like Jen negotiating on the other side, you know, it's a different conversation than someone who is uninformed because we don't necessarily know that they know what they're going to have to deliver so we get a little nervous and we say we just need everything if we know that jen is going to be there or you know some of the other great post supervisors that are out there you know we're going to be more um, able to negotiate we're going to be able to do contingent negotiations um, and to the point of you know needing something for a certain territory what filmation will do is we'll have an active conversation because of how we sell and we'll we can literally say okay let us put this on hold you need to have the money for it or alternatively if we are going to make a sale in a territory that is going to require 35 millimeter we could talk about using some of that money to pay for these deliverables but let's do the math right we've got five territories that need it and it all adds up to significantly more than it will cost to make those elements and it's a smart business decision for the producer the filmmaker to make but having someone there to negotiate those details at the outset is really important because if i don't have someone on the other side i'm going to go look i just need this because we don't know and i can't lock myself into not having it and then not being able to because i'm representing you as the filmmaker right so i have to represent your best interest which is selling the film around the world which means I need the elements in order to exploit it. You want to jump into that, Paul? Well, yeah, I'm just looking back at, you know, when I when I made American Hardcore, which was very low budget and DIY, and then we sold it to Sony Classics. So why, why? The huge audience. Yeah, and yeah, you wanted the huge audience. You don't want to say no to them when they come to you. That's kind of like a dream come true. But, uh, you know, essentially I was delivering to Culver City, you know, I'm delivering to Sony Picture Studios, <laughs> you know, with a guy at Sony Classics who's cool enough to work for them and who I talk to every day. But um, what really worked for me, if there's some filmmakers doing it themselves, is, 
you know, the producer, director, post supervisor, editor, guy calling the delivery guy, that's not something they usually deal with, you know, that's really uh, uh, rare. Um, but they really like that, you know, and they really like talking to me and I had a lot of experience. So while my lawyers negotiated down deliverables a lot, um, I was able to wiggle them down even more just with my day-to-day -day conversations with the delivery guy. You know, I convinced them, listen, I'm not gonna make you all this stuff, I'm gonna give you access at the lab to all this stuff. And I'm gonna give you this and then, you know, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna spend this money this way. And, and they just agreed with me because it made sense. So I, I was able to make my delivery, my delivery easier and easier with Sony based on this, you know, very direct personal relationship. Communication. Yeah, it's all about but communication. Collaboration. But, but also communication something that's very interesting to add into that. What, even if you, you have a delivery schedule, you've got all these things you have to deliver, don't stop asking the questions when it comes time to actually create the element. Do I need to do this? Because what's negotiated six months earlier or four months earlier can change dramatically. Oh, yeah. I rewrite my delivery schedule every month. I am changing something. I am adding a ProRes. I'm taking off a beta. I am, you know, requiring, you know, getting requiring two digital negatives and no IPs and INs. And there's there's all sorts of things we're doing. So I may have a very different opinion at the time you're creating the element than I did when we talked about it a few months earlier. So don't stop the conversation and see if there are other things you can get rid of. It, no, it's pretty funny. And when I first got, just, just just a quick note, when I first got the contract from Sony, um, their delivery schedule was funny because it's basically a delivery schedule from like the 1980s that's continually been redacted. So basically there's like all these deliveries on it in the contract, you know, because they want you to see where they're coming from and how they're already being kind to you. So it's all this stuff crossed out, crossed out. See, you're only going to deliver this, you know? <laughs> And that's, in the, that's on the legal side. So finally, yeah, and finally you get your delivery, um, you know, you, you get your deliveries whittled down with your lawyer. So that's your delivery, and that's where I start negotiating about it personally, you know, because you can just say hold up paying lawyers to negotiate that stuff that's not, yeah. just not going to happen. I have two things, and they're both having to do with budgeting. One, if you have um, investors and you sell the movie, please be aware but the investors probably want their money back before the money's taken out to make these deliverables. And it, it's usually the last, you, you being the filmmaker, probably put in the least amount of money. Um, everyone has faith in you, but they're gonna want their money back. They don't care if they're like, well, we sold it, we need our money back, you go make the deliverables and pay for them. So please be aware of that, because that has happened. I've seen this happen a couple times. And it's horrible for the filmmaker because somehow it ends up coming out of their pocket. Even though, so just in the negotiation process, that is a major thing to be aware of. So the second thing I wanted to say is, if you do budget for deliverables, the basic deliverables, and you're in New York, because we're in the New York Lounge, um, you know, delivery items do count towards the uh, tax incentive. Um, that's 30% in New York City and 35 upstate. <laughs> um, Go Rochester. <laughs> Saratoga Springs. <laughs> uh, just know that some you should probably be able to get rid of this, but some studios still require two sets of elements, which is kind of crazy. Two IPs, two INs. Filmation. Really? Yep. Oh my God. Um, just say that? <laughs> That's kind of bad banking. Yeah, but not two IPs, two INs, two film outs. It's just a very expensive process, but correct me if I'm wrong, Yana and Jen, only one set count towards the, del right. the tax incentive. That is correct. Should we, should we open it up to the audience for a second? Question. Sure. Do you want to, do you want to, yeah. I would think we should open up the audience. No, I think it would be great, but I, 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 would, I can actually explain why we have required two sets of film elements and, and, and trying to do less and less, but in full exploitation, we park one in Europe and we move the other all around Asia and Latin America. Yeah. So it that's just, sense. you know, it's why we need it, and now we're starting to do it less. We're trying to make do with one and just tell those territories that require film that are in Asia and Latin America go to, I don't know what lab still exists now, Chinachita in Italy. <laughs> right. um, so we are, you know, we don't want to have to, we don't want to spend anyone's money unnecessarily, but uh, there, there, was, there were decent reasons until six months ago to do that. Yeah. So uh, would you guys like us to open it up a little bit, ask some questions? She's asking about degradation of um, files or footage, um, 2K versus 4K. Um, again, all these del deliverables today they're digital, in digital form, there's some sort of a codec, and I, I think if you 
name all the codecs, you, it would take you probably 10 minutes just to read them off since the beginning. So, and again, talking about future proofing, it's almost impossible to future proof something today with any codec that exists, because think about five years from now, that's probably not going to be readable. So what, what Mike mentioned before, that you have to constantly convert whatever is um, current. So and even though film is dying, the, the only known archival method right now is to print something to film that you can put on shelf and in 100 years it's still there. So um, again, so the least encoded or, or encrypted your files are, yeah, the most likely the chances you're going to be able to read those further down, um, you know. Now, again, degradation with hard drives is always an issue, of course. Um, it will work today in five years. Good luck. You know, so, and there is LTO tapes. They also have a specific shelf life. Um, but again, the question is, do you think it, what you shoot today, you will be, make money with in 20 years or 10 years? I would say yes. Um, <laughs> that's, I mean, that's our goal, right? We're building up libraries, you're building up a group of assets, and, and if you look at the films that were destroyed, that were made in the 30s and 40s, because, oh, well, if we put them out there, you'll never be seen again, right? Then there was VHS tapes, and then there was, you know, Blu-ray, and then there's on-demand. Those things have, that's, that is the value. When Miramax sold for whatever it was, $87 million. They, well, when it first sold for like, uh, right? Uh, it was like to Disney. Right, and then sold, you know, from Disney for you know eight hundred something thousand a million dollars. That wasn't because of the new movies they were creating. That was the library value of the movies that were made 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago. So, you know, I think those assets are really important. But just you touched on something in storage. So, storing something long term on a spinning hard drive is a really bad idea. If that hard drive doesn't spin, it will stop working, and that data will be unrecoverable. Right, so we've now gone to LTO tape. That's great. Anyone have any LTO ones, twos, threes? Are there any? You know, can you play it? The actual LTO players degrade, so you can even have like a, a player that you put in storage and bring it out, and it won't work either. So you have to be very careful with storing that data. There isn't currently a digital storage format that has any known life. Um, and as as Gunter said, you know a. YCM color separation master um, has a has a white paper life of fifteen hundred years. All right, that's a good asset storage. Even if a hundred years would be good, um, but people aren't doing it anymore. It's really hard. But the studios are. The studios are protecting their assets. Warner Brothers is making YCM separation masters, which, by the way, is black three black and white negatives, each one representing one color: yellow, cyan, magenta, or red, green, blue that you can recombine and recreate the full resolution, full color of your original. That is the only you know, element that, that exists that's a great archive, but most people can't afford to do it. It's, you know, you're gonna spend, what, at best 50 or 60 grand doing it, so you're not gonna do it. But be very careful, in, in, in lieu of being able to do that, really be aware of where do you store that final project, what are you putting it on, don't rely on that hard drive because it just isn't going to fire up in five years. Is that true for solid state drives as well? Does that help solve those solutions? Um, we you don't have the spinning problem, but you have other issues of degradation. Oh, I'm sorry. The problem was, is that true of um, solid state drives uh, as opposed to the spinning spinning disks, like the flat, your flash drives and your solid state drives? Um, it seems to be less of an issue, but other issues uh, ensue. You do have, you have dropouts. You have magnetic dropouts, you have all sorts of stuff. And I actually don't know yet. I haven't seen, they haven't been around long enough for anyone to tell me that in 10 years they're still gonna be great. Yeah. Next question in the audience, okay. Yeah, we were talking a lot about 4K, and one of the things that, as a filmmaker, I'm particularly excited about, particularly because I use like prosumer cameras, is the fact that there's gonna be H.264, and then, you know, I mean, to a certain extent, like Google's, they're doing their own codec. So with that, one of the things that I think is really cool is the higher dynamic range. It's going to be not only rolled out in televisions, but also in the cameras. I was wondering if you could just talk about that for a little bit, like how you think that's going to affect workflow. How it's going to affect what? Work workflow. Workflow. OK. Uh, well, I, take that. I, I, can, I can tell you a little bit about um, higher dynamic range. Uh, it's, it's almost um, the, the opposite of what you think. Um, you have 
on a sensor level, uh, uh, you have um, the capability to record more dynamic range if you have bigger pixels, for example. And, and kind of, we could make today a 20K sensor, no problems. You know, you can have it on an iPhone if you wanted to. It's not a matter of putting enough pixels there, but if you want to maintain a lot of dynamic range, the pipeline, you know, for deliverable that exists today can be used just by saying, okay, we have this 10-bit HD, um, and if we can just have a button on the on these TVs or, or that you can say, okay, enable the extended dynamic range on your monitor, you will instantly get that benefit, and that pipeline is still the same. So there is no real reason to say, okay, we want 4K and we want um, uh, also extended dynamic range. We we want to get there, but as of today, at least from our company, we're, we're working on the next generation camera. When we're ready, that we know we can deliver a better looking picture that, let's say, it is 4K, and it does have that extended dynamic range, range yes, we will, we will then come up with a are you, are, you, are you saying that because of the limitations of the delivery pipeline, you can't even see the dynamic That's range? That's exactly right. Right? right. So, so you, cannot see no, you can't see it. You can't realize it, so even if it's there in your iPhone, you, there's not. You're still seeing what you saw before that uh, the, ch the yeah, chip was there. Yes, yeah, so you have to keep in mind the the television deliverable is kind of the most common denominator. Okay, what TVs can display, and they're all uh, Rec 709 standards. They all kind of fall into this the same spectrum. So so even if you have extended dynamic dynamic range, unless you have a way to enable that to be thrown back at you as a viewer, you will never see it. Um, the question is if there's a new standard REC 2020. Um, there, it, I've heard about the REC 2020 standard. I haven't seen any plans for how it's going to be rolled out, who's going to roll it out, who's going to embrace it, or whether it's going to be completely accepted. I don't know if you've heard either. Um, I'd also point out that you, if you look at things like OLED t TVs, People talk about looking at a standard def signal or image on an OLED and having it seem like it's better than a high def signal on you know, a regular LED or plasma. And then you also add in the multiple frame rates, like a higher frame rate. That actually is the thing that your eye sees as a sharper image. You start going to uh, uh, something that's playing you know, regular speed, but it's 60 or 120 or whatever frames per second. That's the thing that your eye interprets as more real, even more than pixels. Yes, but at the same time, uh, most people that see this, it, the image looks more real, but it, it doesn't seem to be looking better. Rich, now you are, we've all had that experience on your TV that runs at 120 cycles, and you're like, wow, why does that film look like it was shot in video, right? right. It's it like, has, it you adjust like, your TV down. It has like a plastic look. Yeah. It looks almost fake. It doesn't look like how we see as a human eye. And this was also initially when HD initially was rolled out, everything was really sharp and in focus and we don't see that way. That's why people always graduate. I mean, they, 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 they like to use large image sensor cameras, which there's many of them around today because they have shallow depth of field and the image looks more like what we see. We change focus all the time by how we, how we look at things and we never really see the whole room here in focus. You're saying how the eyes, how the eyes see, right? And I remember, do you remember show scan? The Doug Trumbull, it was like 60 frames a sec, right? That was like the idea, like doesn't the human eye see at about 60 frames a second? Yeah. Yes, but at the same time, I, when you see any kind of projection at, at high frame rate, it seems almost, I don't know, it doesn't seem real. If you sit in a movie theater, in order to take advantage of the 4K, you must be a certain distance from the screen. If you're sitting in the middle of the movie theater, you're not even gonna, you're not even gonna see it. And also, for the 4K resolution, I'm with the Area Rental Group, um, but we talked to a producer who is, um, uh, we're servicing um, a TV show for Amazon right now, and we had a very interesting conversation with a producer yesterday who said there are two reasons why they're pushing 4K right now. One is because they want to sell the TVs through Amazon, meaning they need content, so it's a marketing thing. Number two is they want to brag a little bit. It's you know about being on the cutting edge of technology. 
So, I mean, that makes you think, really, you know, what is marketing and what is, you know, facts. So film is essentially a 6K resolution, but, you know, where we're all, like, jumping into this other thing, we, we've gone from higher resolution to lower resolution, right. just in the whole process, and, and now we're trying to inch our way back up to it, and what's really important, I go back to your note in the beginning, it's the story. It's always, this, it's always the story. It, it, you know, people, people will gravitate towards a good story no matter what it is shot in. You know, the capture medium should not dictate the narrative. The narrative but it should always be an airy camera. But it should always be an airy camera. <laughs> <laughs> always be an airy camera. Any more questions in the bank? Come on, usually get more questions. All right, you guys want to add anything to it or should we call it? I mean, uh, the only thing um, I would I would say is that you know the in a in a different sort of deliverables setting um, there are two hundred and it's over five hundred different codecs that are being supported right now. When um, HBO Go is pushing out their product to everybody, there's there's so many flavors that they're making, um, and just to um, just be aware, again, from, from, from a deliverables perspective, there are, um, when, when you create your master, just, just be aware from, I'm sorry, let me, let me back up. The, what we started saying here, and I think I, uh, we should be clear on it, is start figuring where you're going to end when you start. It's, it was the, your first note that was, you know, post-production starts in pre-production. There's so many things you may have to do down the line. If you know what you're going to do in advance, it's great. If you know it's going to be a VOD, you are going to change how you deliver it. You may change how you shoot it. You might change how you store it. You might change processes all along the way so that you can effectively and cost effectively get your finishing um, version. If you don't know, you want to protect yourself. And I think um, for, for the best possible quality that you may wind up with, and that is going to be facilitated by talking to people in advance and getting some good advice from camera, from post-production experts, from delivery people, and then from your own experience. And uh, it's just been great having you guys here on the panel, so thanks for coming. And thank you guys for coming. Have a great Sunday.